We're here at the Ohio History Center today with Megan Wood here in this very cool library space. Can you tell me about this room? Yeah, this is the reading room and this is where we access our archival material. So anything that is paper based, if someone wants to come in and do research, you can do it in this lovely um, location. So we've been talking a little bit about this. 2020 is the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote of the 19th Amendment. And can you tell me about some of these artifacts that we're looking at here today that relate to that? Yeah, so we have a lot of material here at the Ohio History Connection that relates to Ohio's place in the women's suffrage movement. So in Ohio in 1920, right as the amendment was being voted on by different states, Ohio has two presidential candidates. Um, and so there's a lot of activity happening right here in Ohio. Ohio ratifies the amendment um, in June of 1919. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the next year, Ohio suffragists are working really hard to get it passed in 36 states. Tell me about some of the women who were involved in this movement in Ohio at the time. Yeah, so one of the um, characters I like to talk about a lot is um, is Judge Allen, uh, Florence Allen. She was a suffragist from the Cleveland area. And um, post-suffrage, uh, right after the amendment is passed, she runs for a judge position. And she's the first woman in the country to be elected as a judge. And then she's a later uh, appointed to um, a federal judge. She becomes a Supreme Court judge, the um, mm -hmm. first woman mm -hmm. on a Supreme Court, and then is um, appointed by FDR to a federal um, judgeship. And she continues to serve on the bench through the 1940s into the early 50s. But one of the things that Judge Allen said as she looked around at the end of her career, she decided not to get married. She decided not to have a family. She really devoted herself to public service. And she was disappointed that there weren't a lot of other women with her. She was expecting to have more women on the bench. Uh, we tend to think of the suffragist as the woman in the white dress mm -hmm. and the big hat. Um, and, who, the sash. and the <laughs> sash. So oftentimes in the images, uh, like you see here, you see mostly white women. Mm -hmm. Um, in white dresses. Now that doesn't mean that there weren't African-American women. They were being excluded oftentimes from the, um, the public uh, expressions of suffrage um, and by the press. Um, but for the activist women, they are you know, oftentimes middle class of some means. But when you look across the spread, there are, um, because the movement took so long, by the time you get to 1920, you have someone like Harriet Taylor Upton, who's in her 60s, and then you, will, you also have younger women that they're bringing up with them. Tell me a little bit more about Haley Quinn Brown and her impact on the movement. Yeah, so Haley uh, Quinn Brown was born of formerly enslaved parents. They moved into Ohio. Um, she attended Wilberforce uh, College um, and did, so, did a lot of work nationally in activism, but she comes back and teaches there. Um, she helps form the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, and she is an activist for suffrage, um, important in the Republican Party. She actually stumps for Harding on his front porch. Um, and she writes and talks about the experiences of African American women um, in the United States and, and specifically stays and works in Ohio in educating other African American women. Wow, that's amazing. And being able to raise up the stories of people that are lesser known in this movement. Many people have heard of Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but mm -hmm. I think to recognize that there were Ohio women that were in our own communities who were fighting for this and um, have not been as well recognized in the history books. And I think that's the opportunity, is to uncover those stories. Yeah, to shine that light on them, that's mm -hmm. so great. So 1920, um, the amendment passes, but it's not until 1924 that American Indians have the right to vote citizenship. Mm -hmm. And it's um, much later on through the um, 1960s where you see the progression of Asian American women being able to vote. And then um, with the Civil Rights Act and the voting Rights Act, um, abolishing the, um, the barriers that were put in place, especially in southern states. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think one of the sort of falling, the failings of the movement is that for um, especially African American women who were active in, um, and often in their own groups segregated from white, white women, um, in obtaining the right to vote is that when uh, the structural racism made it impossible for African-American women to vote, the, the large group of organized suffragists were not there. They didn't hold them up. Right, they didn't place their bodies, you know, um, like they did in front of the White House to, to make sure that everyone had the right to vote. You know, this movement started as universal suffrage. 
and the abolition of slavery. So that was some of the disappointment. So we're careful to commemorate this anniversary rather than celebrate, is that something that? Yeah, we've been using the language of commemoration, so it gives us the space to have these conversations. And it, I think it helps us look at um, you know, our own actions in the present world and how do we do things differently and how do we learn from those mistakes. Right. What's something that you want someone to take away from this today that they might learn and kind of apply it to their life in today's society? I think probably the most important thing is to go out and vote, to register to vote, to learn a little bit about the candidates, and to vote. I think that when you study these types of movements and you see how hard and for how long people fought to vote, um, that it's, it's hard to take it for granted. Um, it's hard to not be emotional about it. Um, I'm sort of a history nerd and sometimes I cry a little bit when I vote, but <laughs> I, I feel it. like you know someone fought really hard that I have this opportunity. Um, and so I think that's a really important message. And we've been working with the League of Women Voters of Ohio getting that message out as well. That's wonderful, that's so valuable, and you're right, it's easy to mm -hmm. take that for granted. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, I feel like I've learned a lot, and I'm excited for people to come and see the exhibit here and the traveling exhibit as well. Yeah, thanks so much.